Okay, so this is the pre-class video for RPH 140, World Philosophies. Um, it's for class number 21. Uh, it will be our last class on Islam with an emphasis on Indonesia. And this should be a short one, famous last words, but we'll see. Um, let's, let's see. Okay. Um, I, okay. Here we go. Now, there. All right, so, so I received a grant to study in Indonesia, and um, I spent a semester teaching Western thought at an Islamic State University in Bandung, Indonesia. And I knew almost nothing about Indonesia <laughs> because I met someone at a conference from Indonesia. He knew my work, a very little of it, but he knew the presentation that I was going, that I made at the conference that we were at and he knew you know he just talked to me about stuff but he just asked me do you want a Fulbright to Indonesia I have a lot of connections there and I said sure why not so yeah I applied and I got it okay it's very competitive so I'm I was really surprised that I got it honestly but um so then I, as while I was traveling on the airplane to Indonesia, my proposal said that I teach the Western thought, but I know that Islamic thought has a lot of the same trends as the Judeo-Christian and the Greco-Roman tradition, as all of you know by now. Um, so I, that was my proposal is I just wanted to talk to colleagues and find people to read to assign in my classes so that I could teach Western thought with uh, including the Islam, the Muslims in Southern Spain who were Aristotelian. They actually about 1250, 13th century, they synthesized Aristotle with Islam. And Aristotle was translated into Arabic before it was translated into uh, Latin, which just blows me away. I did not know any of this history. But anyway, so I, I just didn't have any time to get prepared. So I thought, oh, well, I have a long airplane trip. So on the airplane trip, I had downloaded his curriculum, the class he usually teaches. And it was all like Xeroxed off of the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and just all this really stuff, the opposite of what I do, right? I try to make you read original texts. That's what I did in my classes. What I actually did was I used to dress up like each of those philosophers that we read. And I think, you know, I did that with the Imam a little bit and I did it with Socrates, but that used to be the whole class. I would always come to class with a different costume on. Um, and so when I read this, I thought, oh my gosh, this is gonna be hard. I don't teach this way. And after about two days, I said, uh, Tajul, I can't do it this way. <laughs> You're going to have to let me do it my way. So I did it my way. And every time 
every day he said, oh, there's something in Islam like that. And I thought, yeah, that's what I figured. So then I had him send me what he thought corresponded, but it just didn't work out at all. It was just quotes from the Quran. And I, what I was looking for was concepts, you know, virtues, all sorts of stuff. And I, all I got were a bunch of quotes from the Quran, but that's okay. Anyway, so I have lots of funny stories and it's fine. I, you don't, I don't need to bother you with all that stuff. But the main thing is that they have, they're the fourth largest country in the world. There's China, India, the US, and then uh, Indonesia has 250 million people. 88% of them are Muslims, um, are moderate Muslims, okay? They're committed to uniting Christianity with Islam. Now, this is ridiculous. I shouldn't, I should have this the correct direction. But anyway, it's in the South China Sea and it's mostly islands. And I was on the island of Java, which is there. And I was just a little bit in, right around there is Bandung. Um, and Indonesia is a country with a lot of islands. And it's also a very multicultural island uh, country because the history of that country is the history of people invading to get resources. So people came in there and took their, um, well, took their people, the Portuguese, enslaved them. And then the Chinese came and took stuff. And then the folks from the Mideast came and took stuff. Every time they, they came, they would stay. And so that, and then eventually the Dutch came, the Portuguese came. Now the Dutch came for the spices, cinnamon, whatever. So spices is a big deal. Obviously it was a big deal for Columbus. Um, so they have multicultural, um, multi-religious culture. They have Hindus and Buddhists and predominantly Muslims, Confucians, the Chinese, Christians, but they have Protestant Christians and Catholic. So when their country was officially founded as a republic, after World War II, because the Japanese, actually there's another group, had, um, had conquered, had been running the country. And then the Japanese got bombed by the US, the nuclear weapons, and they left. And that was when Indonesia took over. But the Dutch, um, had been there before. And so the Dutch tried once again to take over Indonesia. But by now, Indonesia wanted to be a republic, right? So the Dutch signed a treaty and then they broke the treaty. Then they signed another treaty and they broke that treaty. <laughs> so finally, okay, third time around, they stuck to their treaty. Um, so when Indonesia was founded, the founders, especially the founding father, the main one who wrote the constitution, had been educated in the West, but he did not want a constitution that was secular and based on the concept of rights. So they wrote a constitution or well, it has five basic principles from which everything else comes. It sounds more like the Declaration of Independence, but it is the framework from which their society developed, their particular kind of republic. And it's based on the belief in God. But, so obviously, Western 
um, educated Indonesians wanted their own model for democracy. So based on the belief in God, but that had to include Hindu, Buddhist, Confucian, Islam, Protestant Catholic, Protestant Christianity Catholic. And now they've added some more, but everybody has to register as belonging to a certain religion. If you're Muslim, your family, there is another separate section of Sharia law for family decisions, like decisions on divorce and child custody and things like that. And nothing those courts say can violate the national constitution, but they do have, you know, this separate set of laws that you follow if you're registered as a Muslim. All right, so um, that so that's the first principle. And I thought, well, this is compatible with Aristotle. Aristotle's idea of God fits um, with all these various religions because we've done that. Aristotle believed there was a person, impersonal God, just the foundation of the universe. The universe is fundamentally ordered. There's an ordering force principle. It's totally does not intervene <laughs> and is not a person. And there's no books, you know, holy books written about this God. So anyway, in Aristotle, that's why you can combine the virtues with any of these religions. So I thought, well, that's very Aristotelian. And then uh, the other four principles, um, one, uh, involve a much more in, engaged, the political system is expected to do a lot more to construct the society than the American. The American system on paper is minimal government, but Indonesia's is not, and Aristotle's is not, as you know. We are social and political, so we need a set of laws we need laws about distribution of wealth, punishment, all those things are basic necessities. Whereas in America, the only purpose of law is military and police. Nothing about distribution of wealth or resources or access. That's why the Republicans are always criticizing any kind of social programs, public education, anything like that, there's always resistance from the Republicans and they always wanna go back to the founding fathers for minimal government, okay. Anyway, Indonesia wanted something different. And so I thought that was really interesting. And after I got there, I gave a lot of lectures about linking Aristotle and Greek uh, philosophy and culture and the virtues to Indonesia. And I just said, if you're going to be a good Indonesian citizen, you should be a good Aristotelian. Um, because Indonesians also had to worry about separating people's religious belief from their consciousness as a citizen, right? Same as in America. They, you know, they want to avoid extremist religion that's anti-democratic. So <laughs> they have very similar problems that we do. The other thing, um, when they were um, being founded, and I think this is interesting too, they had moderate Muslims, Muslims who wanted democracy because they have 12% of their population. Well, out of 240 million people, that's a lot of people. That's like, that's a lot of people, 4 million or something. And of course you can't not let them be citizens. You'd have the civil war in your hands. So, um, so they, what would be actually, anyway, be about 3 million people. So they, um, so they, where was I? Anyway, they have to separate 
in people's minds, right? Here's what you do to be a citizen. Here's what you do if you want to in your, in your mosque or in your religious capacity. Um, oh yeah, okay. So when it was founded, it had um, all but 12%. 88% of the Muslims were moderate, and then 12% were extremists. They really wanted much more of a religious, uh, a theocracy, an, an Islamic theocracy. Now, I would say in our country, 12% of Christians are pretty extreme. They don't want a theocracy, but they're pretty intolerant. So I think this is probably, you know, a similar pattern. Then, um, then they had two, they were threatened. The democracy was threatened from two extremes. One of them was this radical Islamic that wants Sharia law in an Islamic state. The other side were the Marxists and Marx, Marx's theory is that everything in history is about money and is about exploitation of resources, exploitation of people, and capitalism is constantly expanding and constantly exploiting. Well, if you live in Indonesia, the history of your country is all about people coming in there and exploiting you for resources to make money. That would make a whole lot of sense. Um, and so the Marxists wanted a communist country, right? A, social, a country where the government controlled the economy. That's actually what Marxism is, uh, socialism is. There's no private sector economy. America will never have anything like that. So when the word socialism is used, what they really mean is regulated capitalism. Capitalism with regulations. That's not socialism. Socialism is the government runs the whole economy. And America is not going to have that anytime soon. So, but there were Marxists in Indonesia, which makes sense. So, so the Indonesians that remember the threats from those two extremes are extremely committed to democracy and moderate Islam. So when I talked to my colleagues, they were, um, when I said things like, you can't really be a good Muslim unless there's a separation of church and state, because if they were united, you'd always have ulterior motives, right? You might just become Muslim because you can get a better job, right? So there's just a huge corruption of religion when you have um, a theocracy, especially in the context of Indonesia. Any ambitious person who wasn't born Muslim will just, okay, no, I'm Muslim, you know, it's just, it's all fakey, right? And then the people who are Muslims will use that to oppress all sorts of other people. So it's just, it's a corrupting influence. And so, you know, the vast majority of Indonesians are completely committed to democracy. And so it was really wonderful to be there and to see it and to work with people and it was just embarrassing to me that I did not know that. And I do think Americans need to know that. We need to know that there are many, many Muslims who are support democracy, who are our allies, who, who work very closely with the United Nations. And Southeast Asia is full of the same thing. My students, none of their parents want you know, an Islamic state at all. <laughs> so we need to, we just need to be more educated. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, I actually tried to, to give you these articles from 
the Jakarta post. And I don't think I can download them. So these are just summaries. And uh, I would like you to react to them. Um, just, you know, pick some things, but also I would like you to not just pick one thing, but sort of see how there's a pattern here, right? It's this again, <laughs> not this again. Okay, throughout history, there's been corruption. Um, okay, um, so tradition. there are traditional values, comparative religion, Teaching religion is teaching these shared values, right? Toleration of other religions. This is what we've been doing. Um, the thing, the interesting thing in Indonesia is that the entire educational system, the students are always hearing about God because the culture is based on God, but it's not any one religion's view. And so, and also they unite science with faith. So when you're studying science, you're studying God's creation, right? It's not at all anti-science. It integrates science and an idea of God. So, um, so they are working on their curriculum, their education laws. Um, another reason I got this, grant was because in 1945, they got independence, but then the opposition party, the founding father kept getting reelected and reelected. And, and then he appointed someone to be the head of the military. This was his friend and his friend conducted a coup. <laughs> and this is because the way the rhetoric worked was that the founding father who was president had been a Marxist for a while. And so the military guy said, oh, the country's being taken over by Marxists. You know? <laughs> and so he, he performed a coup. Then after he took over, it was, there was a lot of brutal killing of people, but in 1988, he told the Islamic um, universities, there were like five Islamic universities, students had to decide, parents decided from kindergarten on, are you gonna go to an Islamic school? Or are you gonna go to a secular school? And then they had this whole separate system of education. But again, it's, uh, they learned Islam as compatible with democracy. So that whole it, branch of the education was instructed to teach it in a way that was compatible with democracy. Then in 1988, the president said, we will give you funding, government funding, if, you teach, you have to teach Western thought, feminism, world religions, right? You have to teach all these Western classes. So every college educated Indonesian is taught this completely moderate pro-democratic higher education view of Islam. So there were, there are more publications, scholarly publications about the history of Islam as a moderate history than in any other country. So that scholars are publishing stuff that brings up the history, the, the moderate history. And they quote the theologians quote from the Quran and emphasize the moderate aspects of it. So, um, that was, that was the background. And um, so the editorials in the Jakarta Post, which is the English language uh, newspaper were really good. Oh my gosh. They were so much better than the editorials in the New York Times and all that. Anyway, so that was one of them was about holistic education. Um, and 
holistic education for human values. And you can look this over. It really, really tried to synthesize. Their curriculum is much more um, dedicated from kindergarten on to synthesizing science, social science, religion, humanities, putting them all together and educating the whole person. Um, all right, humanitarian values. So humanism, it's definitely Islamic humanism. Um, Muhammad is quoted as saying his goal is to refine the character of human beings. You would understand that. Um, then they had articles that, again, were so much like um, the U.S. They're, they're more extreme. It's more of a problem there. But of course, it's a young country. It's got a lot of poverty. It's less stable. Um, there was a conflict about building a church. There's a problem with the Supreme Court versus the local government. So local government officials only get elected if they tell the people, I'm going to try to, you know, I'm not going to let a Christian church be built here. So, of course, the Supreme Court is saying you can't do that. Well, that happens in the U.S. There are state governments that pass laws that are illegal. Arkansas is always passing laws that are illegal, and somebody has to take it to the, to the courts and eventually to the Supreme Court if it keeps getting appealed. Okay, so these are lower class people, so they're less educated and they're marginalized by development. I mean, I think the same thing happens in the US. The people who are feel most threatened by non-Christians in our case, tend to be the same cohort. Um, all right, so there's another article about extremists or intolerant um, groups that are demonstrating. Um, Islam has the, this conflict between the Shia and the Sunni. So Sunni Muslims, most of them are Sunni, but the, and that went back to that original who gets to carry on the legacy? Is it Muhammad's daughter's husband or his brother? That's what it goes back to. Um, and then there was an article about Muhammad. He's a consistent protector of minority rights. Um, and so this is a lot like what Houston Smith said. He was born into this culture and he taught all these virtues, all that stuff. Um, and here's a quote about how he insisted on toleration, religious toleration. Um, okay, so, so, I mean, the reason I, I put that in there and I wanted you to read those editorials is because I had been teaching this class for a number of years and then I go read these editorials and it's like they are saying the same thing. Um, all right, then another part of this was Indonesian students wanted, were applying to study in the U USA. So here's the, the basic principles of their political philosophy, um, belief in God, a just and civilized humanity. So the political system has to um, be proactive to create laws and institutions to, to civilize people. So it's not just military and police. Um, then Indonesian unity to get people to get along in spite of their different religions. Um, and number four is interesting because these are very Aristotelian concepts wisdom through deliberation. Deliberation is that conversation, right? Not too much, not too little, the mean. And then, do you remember we talked about political deliberation, political wisdom, practical wisdom, right? 
when you're deciding what to do, you decide what the options are and then which option is best and why. That's deliberation. And so they have that right in there, um, the basic pillars. So the, the, but the point is, one important point is that the pr president of Indonesia did not um, say that his thing was influenced by Aristotle because in Southern Spain, the two scholars that synthesized Aristotle and Islam were declared heretics. And so I, I know that the president knew that. And so he knew, he took Aristotle as a model, I'm sure, but he didn't say that because that would alienate pe people right away. Okay, so what kind of programs? Um, this is here. The US founders were enlightenment thinkers and they thought they were engaged in the science of government. So the idea that most Americans don't accept science and evolution is just, you have to understand how far this is from our founders. Okay, so. Um, the, these, the students' goals, all right. So our country was founded on a new paradigm for um, governing, right? Human rights, natural rights. Totally different from Europe was the divine right of kings, the right of an aristocracy and aristocratic class to inherit political power, right? So we were in a paradigm shift. So these students are also in Indonesia, they're, they're writing proposals to go to the US and get master's degrees in public policy. And they're talking about this switch in paradigms to a more systems thinking orientation. Everybody's a lot more connected than they used to be. Um, all right, so, so these are the proposals, and I just thought they were interesting. They want to clean up corruption in the Indonesian government. You could picture Americans, there's American students like you, you know, undergrads that are applying for master's degrees, master of law focused on anti-corruption law, um, students focus on public administration, the U.S. has more programs in public policy and public administration than anywhere in the world. And yet most Lyon students I have have never heard the two words public and policy <laughs> been put together before, right? It is, again, it's scary. Our educational system doesn't educate people for citizenship. Um, so I, I thought you might be interested in that. I was really interested. And I, the whole thing was so fascinating. And um, so I just love making analogies, right? Similar and different. But one of the proposals um, I was looking at for another, I was also approving um, proposals myself. And this woman was an engineer and she wanted to come to the US and figure out how to make um, concrete out of rice husks, <laughs> which is again, is so amazing. Cause when I show you these slides of Indonesia, everything's made out of concrete which makes sense. I think it's cheaper. I mean, wood, it would be terrible. They would deforestation would be a terrible problem. Um, so it's concrete. Uh, con concrete's also cool, you know. Um, it's, there's lots of reasons, but, and then they have so much rice because they eat so much rice. So she wanted to make concrete out of rice husks. I was like, go for it. Um, so many things. I. Personally, I never would have thought of. And I'm supposed to sort of sit there and think, okay, do I think this should get approved? 
Oh, what the heck? <laughs> Sounds good to me. Um, so let's see, what else did I want to show you? We have Islamic environmental ethics that um, all the religions, remember Hinduism was in favor of environmental presentation. Uh, and so was Buddhism and so was Islam. It's just the problem isn't the religions, it's capitalism, it's the economic systems we have, but then it's also that the political leaders um, use religion to maintain their power and they have to make deals with capitalists. So religions come off as anti-environment or indifferent. And a lot of people in those countries think, well, it's God's will, God will decide, you know, um, or God wants to end life on earth as long as you believe, or, you know, same stuff that we have here in the US. Um, so I think, um, I think actually I, I don't have any long readings for you. So give you a chance to catch up. The, on Wednesday, we have um, a number of readings, three readings. So if you wanna go and do those ahead of time. So I'm just giving you a heads up on that. But this is this day, I wanted to give you a lecture about democracy in Indonesia and uh, just tell you stories. Partly because of course I love talking about the story, but mostly just to give you a sense that there's a whole world out there for you, 65 years. You've got 65 years ahead of you. I can tell you, I never ever would have thought that I would be teaching, you know, Western thought at an Islamic state school in Indonesia. I didn't know where it was, right? I didn't know nothing. So if you just work hard, you know, at what you're doing and think, I'm, you know, you don't have to know exactly what you want to do for your job, you know, just keep saying, you know, I'm going to do my best here and some door will open, or I'm going to take this class and maybe it'll strike me that this is what I want to do. This is my sense of calling. But even then, you know, you feel called to do one thing, five years later, it branches into something else. So just keep an open mind. I myself did not know where the next meal was coming from until I was 50. Okay. And so, yeah, it, it wasn't easy. I wasn't starving, but I really didn't have a plan and I didn't have a guaranteed job until I was 50. Well, then I had a job that I couldn't be fired from unless the school broke, uh, closed, or unless I sexually harassed a student. And I can tell you, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. So anyway, my life just changed overnight in terms of job security, but I did struggle. And so I just want you to know that um, keep going, right? And you have no idea what doors might open for you. So I think I won't bother you anymore right now. I'll just show it to you tomorrow. Um, oh, let me just see if there's anything else I wanted to say. So there was the, oh yeah, well I have all these gorgeous pictures of uh, Buddhism in Bali and Hinduism in Indonesia and my mother was an art historian. And that's how I learned my philosophy and religion. It was through the art. And the arts are very powerful. Most kids growing up, when they go to church, it's the music, the dance, the building, the space. They have an aesthetic experience, right? And uh, OK, so hearing, usually there's music seeing there's some visual space that's sacred, smelling. In the Catholic church, they would have incense also, right? Tasting, that's the communion. 
and then touching in the Catholic Church, they would have a rosary. So the Catholic liturgy is very carefully uh, designed to get people using all of their senses to think about the spiritual life. So, so the arts have played this huge role in all the wisdom traditions to get people starting with sensuality into the realm of spirituality. So that I will talk about that some more. It's really fun. Um, so you get a little bit of a reprieve to do a little more homework. I just checked how many posts there are that I haven't read. There's only seven and I think most of them are the same person. So um, yeah, a number of you are behind. And I did, I, you know, I've had Akaya contacted me, so she, I know what her plan is. I don't mind at all filling out an incomplete. Uh, it's no criticism of any of you. Just make sure you fill out the form. That's it. Let's see. And so I guess, I guess I'll quit for now. Just remember for Wednesday, there is, um, there are a lot of articles to read. Okay. <laughs>